Okay, thanks a lot for the nice extended introduction, and um, I'm looking forward to all the talks and also visiting <coughs> Cambridge. Last time I was here is when we were doing the Samsung uh, Neuromorphic Processor Project, and we had a nice meeting here at Cambridge, sitting near the Jesus uh, Green, right? Yeah. Um, so as uh, Olivier said, that I'm at the Institute of Neuroinformatics in Zurich, which is a large research institute, maybe six or seven groups in there, working on all kinds of different things, neuroscience, electrical engineering, AI, and so forth. And uh, I co-direct the sensors group together with Shichi, who's standing back here. This is a group of sensors people along with uh, associated other people, you know, friends and visiting students and so on. And we've been working for a long time on neuromorphic sensors, but we also do AI, uh, digital, digital AI hardware accelerators, and we work on audio signal processing. And now I'm working a lot on robotic control, neural robotic control, neural uh, nonlinear optimal uh, control of robots. But today I'm going to speak about something that I think I didn't have time to really fully put together, but it's one, something that's close to my heart, which is uh, what are the noise limits of these event camera silicon retinas? Because that really hasn't been understood in the same way that it's been understood for CMOS image sensors. You know, for CMOS image sensors, it took about 20 years for people to really get to grips with what were the noise limits and how to get the read noise and um, the dark current and all this kind of stuff really working. And a lot of that good work was done in industri industry, like at Apple and, and Samsung and other places. So this is something that has just been started to be considered for the silicon retina event cameras. So my plan today is show you a little bit what is an event camera. Maybe you don't know so much about them. What's the history of development? I'll conclude with a recent uh, event camera that was uh, published, a frame event camera that was um, published last year at ISSCC from Omnivision. And then I'll go on and talk about the noise limits, which I think is quite interesting subject. And it goes back to the 1970s, actually, consideration. And then I hope to do a demo at the end of that. So this beautiful video here from Davide Scaramuzza, who did a lot to promote these cameras, shows a comparison between a frame camera and an event camera watching this moving dot here. Normal camera will uh, produce you know, these pictures, sequence of pictures, but it aliases the dot. And event camera just puts out a stream of brightness change events. And normal camera just keeps putting out the same frame over and over again. Event camera just stops putting out any events when the image stops moving. But if a dot starts moving really fast, a normal camera will motion blur the dot and alias it terribly. And ideally, an ideal event camera will just put out a tighter helix of these brightness change events in space time. That's the basic idea in a nutshell. And hopefully that makes it clear. Um, I hope it's clear to people. That's the idea. And that mimics in some way uh, the uh, part, part of the function of the eye. And our big breakthrough in this area was to develop this dynamic vision sensor pixel around 2005, Patrick Lichtsteiner and I. And I'll show you guys how many people here are circuit designers. Only a tiny fraction of people. Oh, I thought there'd be a lot of CMOS designers here. OK, anyway, I'll try to guide you through some transistors here. But there's really no transistors here. It's a logarithmic photoreceptor that mimics what the eye's photoreceptor does. It's running continuous time. And then it's capacitively coupled to the circuit that mimics the action of the bipolar and ganglion cells that send the spikes to the brain. And what, the way this works is every time the pixel detects one of these brightness change events, it resets this capacitor to a fixed voltage. And then it opens the switch. It disconnects the switch. And so if there's any change here in the log intensity, it's coupled right to this point, and then it's amplified. So it's A times the change in log intensity. And then it's compared in continuous time to these two thresholds. And so when the pixel detects that the brightness has changed by some amount, um, it makes this brightness change event and then sends the address of the pixel off chip. Instead of the value, it just sends its own address off asynchronously uh, through a communication bus. And then it resets the pixel. And so the result is that the output of each pixel is a stream of these brightness change events, log intensity change events. Is that clear? OK. And so I'm going to show you three key features of this pixel that I think are really cool, that really led to its success, or at least its impact. The first key feature is mismatch reduction. In reality, every transistor is different. Because of the random dopant fluctuation in the channel implant, there's threshold variation from, from transistor to transistor, and it's big. And this is the single biggest thing that held back 
neuromorphic electronic engineering, this, pixel, this transistor mismatch. And this mismatch, for instance, exhibits itself in a random threshold variation from pixel to pixel, like this. And that means you can't set the threshold very low because it means that when you reset the pixel here, it'll not be reset. It'll still fire. You can't reset it at all. And so, but this gain element here, which is well-controlled switch capacitor circuit, reduces the impact of this mismatch by a factor of this A. So it turns this big spread into a much smaller spread, much closer to the origin. It squeezes those histograms together close to the origin. And so that way you can actually set a reasonable threshold for these brightness change events. This, element, this active gain element after you've removed the, D, the huge DC mismatch from this log intensity front end, which is also caused by transistor mismatch. The second key feature is bandwidth enhancement in this photoreceptor circuit here, which is an active transimpedance logarithmic amplifier. Here is the photodiode here. There's a feedback transistor. And what happens in this is that there is a voltage amplifier here set by this MN and this uh, load here. And this forms a loop so that when the photocurrent increases, this voltage goes down a bit. This goes up 100 times as much. And so what happens is this gate goes up instead of the source going down. And so what that does is that the feedback loop increases the MFB source conductance by a factor of this loop gain, a factor of 100, thus reducing the RC time constant of this front end, also by a factor of 100. So it turns this huge passive, photo, this huge passive capacitance into effectively a much smaller one by making this source conductance appear to be much higher. I hope that's clear, right? Because when now I pull down one millivolt here, the gate goes up 100 millivolts. So it looks like the source conductance is much bigger. That reduces the time constant. And so it can be quick even at low light intensity. The third key functional aspect is this really cool, precise seven transistor, two capacitor change detector, which is formed by these transistors here. You see one, two, three, four, five, six, and then one reset switch here, and then two capacitors. And the way this circuit works is that it amplifies the change in this voltage here. This is just a buffer circuit, unity gain, by this capacitor ratio. Because this feedback loop holds this node at a virtual ground. And so now if this voltage increases by one millivolt, this one millivolt times C1 charge that you put onto here has to be balanced by some VD change times C2. So if you make C2 smaller than C1, VD has to move more than VSF. And it's set by this capacitor ratio, which is the best match thing you can build in silicon. Capacitor matching is very precise. And so you get a very uh, precisely controlled uh, voltage gain out of this in a rather compact circuit of just seven transistors. Because these guys now balance here at the reset point of this. It diode connects this FET. And now you set the threshold by the ratio of I on to ID and I off to ID. And so then. Um, any change here basically just turns into a digital signal here that you can detect as an event. The, th the last functional factor, which is really accidental, is really cool. It's, it's a temperature independent threshold. It turns out that the, temp that the threshold for a brightness change is, te is totally temperature independent in this pixel for the following reason. This front end photoreceptor has a gain to change in log intensity, which is proportional to UT, which is the thermal voltage, which is proportional to the absolute temperature. So this is proportional to UT. In other words, if you increase the temperature, this voltage change will increase more. And it turns out this is amplified, as I said before, by this capacitor ratio. That's well controlled. And the threshold for the change over here is also proportional to thermal voltage because of the, these circuits are operating in subthreshold. So this is proportional to thermal voltage, but also the threshold is proportional to thermal voltage. They're both proportional to thermal voltage. So if you can set these subthreshold bias currents here, ID, I on, and I off, to a constant ratio, which is very easy to do just by transistor sizing or uh, actually using a current splitters, um, it means that the threshold for on and off events is just a function of the back gate coefficients, which are well controlled. Um, and the capacitor ratio, and the log of the ratio of these currents to ID. And so that's temperature independent. It's really cool and accidental. We didn't design it that way. It just turned out that way, right? 
I think that's about all I'm going to show about transistors, and I hope you, it's, it's enough. Okay. So that turned into the DVS-128 event camera. Here's Rafa Berner, one of my uh, wonderful PhD students, with a bunch of cameras that we built ourselves with our own hands. And uh, through any labs, our, our internal spin-off, we sold at least 500 of these uh, to the early adopter community and computer vision and you know, robotics and places like that. And um, here is Patrick Lichtsteiner, actually, in one of the first videos he shot with sunglasses showing a thing, uh, a, a white chart with some black lines on it. You can see the brightness change events here. Where it's gray, there's no brightness change event. Where it's white, it got brighter. Where it's dark, it got darker. And he's holding up sunglasses in front, and you see, because of the log intensity change, it doesn't see the sunglasses. It sees right through the sunglasses. Because the contrast behind the sunglasses is the contrast not behind the sunglasses. So that's really cool. So this had a big impact, but it was very weird to computer vision community, and it was missing one fundamental thing that we have and that you all are seeing me with right now, right? And the fact is that biology, um, Simon will like this, it's from Bob Roddick, or maybe you won't. Anyway, biologic, biology, all biological visual systems have some kind of sustained and transient pathway. The transient pathway, which starts in certain cells in the retina and goes through the thalamus in different certain layers in the thalamus and even is di even diversified in the in entry layers of early visual cortex, has coarse spatial resolution, it's quick, and it sees gray only. And that's like our DVS camera, dynamic vision sensor. What people mostly think of as vision and what in these beautiful pictures that you just saw is more like the sustained pathway. It has fine special resolution, it's rather slow, and it sees color. That's like standard CMOS image sensor. So we had to put something like that back into the camera because it's, you can do many problems just with the transient pathway, but you need frames or at least sustained pathways somehow for some things. And it turns out that this is very cheap to do in the Davis, which is dynamic and active pixel vision sensor. Here's the DVS pixel again, abstractly. And you notice this photo current here is flowing through this logarithmic photoreceptor. We can now stick onto that an APS readout circuit. All this does is integrate onto this capacitor abstractly. It's not exactly like this, of course, over a fixed time and then reads out the voltage difference between the reset and, read le and signal levels. And we share the same photodiode exactly. So we don't have to duplicate the photodiode. The current flows right through this transistor circuit, and we can now integrate it not as well as a normal APS because we have more dark current, et cetera, but we can get a picture that way. And that's uh, shown here in this Davis video with Christian Branley. Um, you know, we shot this in the foyer of the Institute of Neuroinformatics here. And it's one of the first videos that we got. Christian is catching a football, and you can see now the events are actually going ahead of the frames. You see how these events, these brightness change events? are sent out concurrently with the frames. So it actually seem to go ahead of the frames. The frames are global shutter frames. They s expose all the pixels at the same moment. But the football output is extremely sparse compared to the frames, hundreds and hundreds of times less data, even at these frames at a low frame rate. And so that's all nice, but it, actually these frames are rather low quality, right? There's one pixel per DVS pixel, and that's not like biology. So we did another sensor. Um, um, let me see if I can get ahead here. Um, Cheng Han Li, another student, did this, the, the C. Davis, which is the first true hybrid vision sensor. It's a hybrid between APS and, uh, and DVS, active pixel sensor and dynamic vision sensor. And here's the pixel of this. It has one white Davis pixel with all the brightness change detection and so on. And then it's interspersed with, every Davis pixel is interspersed with three <coughs> red, green, blue, four transistor global shutter pin photodiode APS pixels. These are just pixels directly from Tower Jazz, which we adapted to this uh, chip. And so now you have three times as many APS pixels as DVS pixels, and here's a video of that. You see the brightness change events here, uh, and also uh, Tringhan's hand, and here is just DVS output. But in the background are these nice RGB frames. Okay, so this thing, can I have some water? I'm coughing here. So this thing had really no impact because we didn't do anything to promote it, right? But it was the first hybrid vision sensor with true 
true uh, thank you. <coughs> it was the first true hybrid of these sensors. But it got it disappeared into the International Image Sensor Workshop, and we never actually made cameras out of it and got it into people's hands. But that led now to a rapid evolution of the events based pixel and array size. This is a function, this is a year here, and this is the pixel pitch of these event cameras. Uh, pixels, starting with the um, DVS-128 you saw. This is the Davis here, 90K pixels down to 18 micron pixels. And this rapidly evolved over the last few years down to about three to five microns from industrial cameras. Um, actually, is it logarithmic? No, not really. Anyway, I don't know what function it is. It's like Moore's law, basically scales like Moore's law. And the main reason that happened was during this period of about three years here, there were industrial backside illuminated and stacked wafer DVS. Right now, uh, originally we had monolithic devices, and then as soon as the industry came along with these processes like Samsung and Sony, uh, they were able to make stack sensor. Here's a uh, Sony uh, 90 nanometer top and 40 nanometer bottom a thing where there's a copper bump um, between the wafers at each pixel. This gets really high fill factor with a pretty small pitch. And the way it works is on the top photodiode, on the top wafer, you just have the photodiode and a couple of NFETs, and then there's a copper-copper bump, and then the bottom, um, it has this bias here. I'm not sure exactly what this is, but anyway, all the rest of the PIX transistor, which is like 40 transistors on this bottom digital wafer. And so that really works to, to scale things quickly. Yeah, it's more like a real retina then, right, with multiple layers. And so I'm going to show you now and can conclude this brief history with what was published uh, last year at ISSCC. There were three out of eight image sensor papers were actually these event cameras, uh, uh, two from Sony and one from Omnivision. I'll just show you the Omnivision one because they nicely supplied me some video. And this is kind of complicated, but I'll, I'll get you, guide you through. It's actually a triple wafer stack. So the way it works is you have one of these DBS pixels, this one here, and 15 um, normal APS pixels in each macro pixel, 1 to 15. And you see how they're arranged here on this top wafer. There are micro lenses. Uh, it's three wafer stacking, actually. So there's top wafer has micro lenses. It has the color filter array. It has pin photodiodes. Um, it has the NFETs for the APS readout. And it has, I believe, a single copper bump per 16 pixels. They, they, they're, they're cagey about that. But this co single copper bump is connecting this photodiode, the white one, with its pinned uh, photodiode here. Uh, there's the transfer gate. This copper bump is connecting to the middle wafer. And the middle wafer has the DVS circuit. You'll recognize it here, right? Switch cap. It has uh, some memory and handshake. It has a time to digital converter, um, you know, to get a precise timestamp of the event, and some other stuff. There's lots of room there. And then you'll notice something cool here. They, this is copper to copper, it's easy, but then to connect the bottom wafer, they have to use through silicon via. And these through silicon via are on the edge of the die, just like it is for all of TSVs. And this through silicon via then connects the row and column lines for the APS to a conventional um, APS stuff down here, including uh, lots of digital stuff like an event signal processor that does denoising. Um, an image signal processor that does all the standard demosaicing and you know, denoising for thing, and even a mobile industry processor interface, so you get a nice interface direct to a smartphone. So that's the state of the art right now, or at least one of them. I should also check these Sony papers. And uh, they nicely supplied these samples from their sensor. Um, uh, using this combination of frames and events, you can do things like rolling shutter distortion correction. Here on the left, you don't, you have, uh, because the pixels are not sampled, uh, like in global shutter, they're sampled in a rolling shutter way, you have this uh, barrel distortion kind of artifacts. You see these edges are curved here. By using the events, you can not only de-blur these edges, but also remove this rolling shutter distortion. And the second example is de-blurring. Uh, this is under lower light conditions. The frames are captured at 120 frames per second, but if you you have this uh, uh, blurring here, but by using the events, you can de-blur and get much sharper edges. And the last thing is this very impressive slow motion video, which has the equivalent of probably like 5,000 frames a second. 
this balloon. Even though the frames are only at 120 frames per second, they can capture like 5,000 per second, frame per second uh, slow motion by using the events to reconstruct, reconstruct slow motion video. This takes an expensive, deep convolutional recurrent neural network, but um, it's been demonstrated by other people that this image reconstruction, this video reconstruction, is possible with a, a pretty big, uh, deep, CN, deep recurrent CNN. Okay, so that's a summary of the state of the art. Is any questions about that so far? Maybe I'll take a break. So the rest is all new stuff. Is it too fast? Okay, it's a bit fast probably. <laughs> anyway, you let it sink in, all right? Now I'm gonna go on um, here. So this is all really great for consumer electronics and so on, who have the resource, these big companies have the resource and the fab, you know, to build these pixels, multi-stacked wafers, and really aggressive. Us academics cannot afford to do work in this domain. And so we decided to focus on something that industry is not gonna do, which is a scientific event camera. A, a, one of these event cameras is targeting scientific applications. And this question we asked ourselves in the Swiss uh, National Science Foundation project is, can we build a large pixel DVS that can see smaller contrast brightness changes under lower illumination? And so the motivation for the scientific event camera is that DVS is actually a good candidate for high-speed scientific applications like neural imaging, where you have things like spikes that happen very sparsely, but asynchronously in time and infrequently. And you'd like to capture that in, say, in a brain implant running continuously um, you know, all the time so you can perhaps do things like quenching, um, quenching um, events like um, uh, epilepsy, you know, quenching epileptic events and things like that. And you can now measure neural activity optically extremely well. The problem is if you want to do neural voltage imaging where the indicator protein is bound into the membrane of the neuron, uh, the contrast is very small. So this is actually slowed down by 400 times of a single cell body of a neuron um, image with voltage imaging. The contrast is a peak about 2% and it happens very quickly in a few milliseconds. And so to get this data from 2015 uh, with this voltage indicator that's bound into the, it's sensitive to the membrane voltage, it's bound into the membrane, they had to really blast the tissue with like 25 times sunlight literally like blast it with light, right, to get this SNR high enough. And things have gotten better now with these voltage indicators, but still, this is a promising candidate for measuring the spike timing, which is critical to detect things like epilepsy. You have to know about the timing of stuff in the brain. And so the current situation is that current DVS are too noisy and not sensitive enough. This is the best we could do in 2017 with our, our one of our sensitive DVS, or maybe our backside illuminator, DV, uh, Davis. And this is actually, you'll notice here on the right, um, a calcium spike. Calcium creates much higher contrast, maybe 20% contrast, because it's in the body of the, of the cell, and calcium concentration rushes up tremendously when the, when the cell spikes. But still, you notice this extremely noisy background, and you could just barely see a spike in one neuron. So the question is, can we do better? And that comes to a very fundamental question, which Simon will like, and the question is, how many photons are needed to reliably detect a spot of a certain size and contrast? And it goes back to this beautiful book, or the chapter of a book from Al Rose. Anybody know this book? Yeah, Simon knows it. Vision, Human, and Electronic. Al Rose was an engineer at RCA. And uh, this, on the cover of the book, he really shows the key idea, right? This is a picture of this young lady with more and more exposure of photons. Here, you can't, can't tell it, it's her. There, you can barely tell, oh, it's a young lady, right? Now you see more and more detail. The more you expose it, and the less shot noise, relative shot noise you have. And in this beautiful chapter, I recommend digging this out because it's just so beautiful, the, the arguments in this. In his very first chapter, he does two experiments with a flying spot sensor. In 1970, he could do single photon detection. So he did these experiments, which I'm going to tell you about. The first experiment is you shine onto a scene, and each one of these dots here is one detected photon. You shine onto a scene and say, ask, do you see any black spots there? Are there any black spots in this picture? Yeah, maybe here, here, right? It turns out there are no spots there. This is just a black, this is just a white sheet, right? But you hallucinate black spots. Now, if you 
now shine the light on this test pattern. The same, same exposure on this test pattern. Which plots do you think you can see? Yeah, only the big ones, right? Here, 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 and then when they get too small there, you can't distinguish them from noise, right? You can see this line just barely here, right, this one? Yeah, it's cool. So that was the first experiment, right? And the experiment two, he created a beautiful chart where um, the size and the contrast of the spots change as you go across the chart. This is actually exposed in an early experiment from him. For each spot, the diameter decreases by a factor of two, and for each row, the contrast decreases by a factor of two. And you see at a certain point, even in this picture, you can't see the spot anymore. But now look what happens if you expose this picture to different levels of exposure of photons. This is, again, single photon detection. Uh, with, um, I don't know what this one is, but these are relative, the relative number of photons that this picture is exposed to uh, increases by four in every one. And you notice something cool. If you have one here, you can't see even the biggest spot. Here you can just see this one. With 16, you can see maybe these, this row. With 64, you can start to see this row. With 256, that one, and so on. The more you expose, the further you can see low contrast and small spots. And so this is all summarized in some mathematics, beautiful mathematics having to do with uh, statistical variation of shot noise and also reliability of um, being at a uh, certain distance from the, uh, the mean of a Gaussian. I don't have time to go into that, but what it boils down to is that reliably seeing small low contrast objects under dim illumination is hard. And more than that, it says that the difficulty goes as a square of the contrast square of the illumination and square of the size of the object. So it's, everything is harder and harder, right? When things get smaller, lower contrast, or less light, it gets much harder. So that's the difficulty we face also in a scientific DBS because we want to see small changes under low illumination. So now Rui Grassa, and the reason I was so busy and couldn't prepare this talk is because we had three PhD students graduate, but Rui is one of them. He's the one who worked on this scientific event camera. This is the ad for his exam, and this is his setup in the dark room with a very low contrast test stimulus. And I'm going to show you now some of his slides. <laughs> um, I'm getting some email here from Katrine, uh, which is the story. I don't know how much time I have left, but the maybe five, ten minutes? Yeah. Ten minutes, right? Okay, so the DBS sensitivity is limited by threshold mismatch and noise. And so you saw the scheme before where we put a, an amplifier there to reduce the input referred mismatch here uh, by putting this gain. And various groups now have tried to put another preamplifier in here to increase the gain even more, to move the threshold even smaller. The problem with these, these had a fixed gain, so they limited the dynamic range, and they also didn't consider noise at all in their design and so the DBS noise was not really well understood before this work, and noise wasn't pr properly considered in the design of these sensitive DBS. And so to understand DBS noise, I'm going to show you this picture, which I captured here in the office. This is a wall with some dark cabinet and a dark patch, and also a white wall. And you notice that the noise in the dark part is much higher. And it was somewhat a mystery why the noise in the dark part is much higher. Maybe it's not a mystery to you, but still we didn't understand the mechanism why the noise in the dark part of the scene is much higher. These are all noise events, by the way. Nothing's changing, right? It's flashing between uh, frames on and frames off. So why are there no no noise events in the dark? And fundamentally, how close to photon shot noise limit is the DVS photoreceptor? And so Rui set up a nice setup with integrating Sphere, a test board for his side DVS chip, dark room cabinet, lots of Keithleys and scopes and stuff, and did lots and lots of measurements and modeling. And if you look at the photoreceptor here, he now could derive a transfer function. This shows as a function of uh, temporal frequency the noise power spectrum in volts per hertz, volts squared per hertz, at a particular photoreceptor bias. And it has a typical shot noise characteristic and then a low pass roll off. And now we can fit that very accurately from fundamental circuit properties like capacitance and, and current that you know. Moreover, his analysis allowed you to split it up into contributions of the photoreceptor, this amplifier, which is this curve here, and the photon shot noise itself, IPD, which is this curve. There are two contributions that contribute to the total noise. 
Moreover, his theory now allows you to say, what happens if you crank this bias up to make this amplifier faster? Here's what happens. Now, the, if you compare it here, this is the contribution of the photodiode, and if I now turn the bias up, that one doesn't change. Right? It actually changes slightly, but not much. What changes is the contribution of this circuit here. It spreads out into this green curve here. Because you're running this guy faster here, its noise contribution drops from this down to this curve. And it's spread over a much higher bandwidth. And so what we finally realized, which is kind of obvious in hindsight, is that by cranking this bias up and spreading this noise in this circuit to a higher bandwidth, we can now use a following low-pass filter to chop off this noise. And then, if you're willing to burn the power, you can answer the question, how close to the photon shot noise limit is the DBS? It's actually limited to twice the photon shot noise because there's one contribution from the photodiode and one contribution from the source of this subthreshold transistor. These guys add together here, and that goes all the way back to Rahul Sharpesker's result with me and Carver in 1992, where we showed this simple log photoreceptor had exactly twice the photon shot noise limit. But now we understand it for the DVS. So the question is, how do you actually do that in a circuit? And so I can't show you the detailed circuits um, here because they're, it's, this paper has been submitted to VLSI Symposium. But I'm going to show you the principle of Rui's preamplifier. First is that if you look at the preamplifier output as a function of log intensity, normally it clips at a certain range, right? This is the lowest. These are the power supply rails here. And that limits the dynamic range to about 60 dB instead of 120 dB, which you normally have from a DVS. So a factor of 1,000 instead of a million in intensity. And in previous DVS, uh, sensitive DVS, what they did is they globally centered this at a particular place uh, according to the average light intensity. And now what Rui did is he, um, he built a, a new circuit here which self-censors on each event at each pixel. So it maintains the overall dynamic range. Second thing he did was he realized that this buffer here is very important for reducing noise. And so if you look at the transfer function of this unity and buffer here, in previous DVS, it looked kind of like this, a low-pass filter, but it was limited to a minimum frequency of about 200 hertz because nobody thought about this problem. And so Rui just designed a better buffer with longer FETs and, and thick gate, and he could reduce it down to 3.5 hertz. And so this has a dramatic effect. And we also added spatial integration. So here are four pixels independently. It turns out that you can easily short together the photodiodes and the photoreceptor outputs, and you add a binning mode, which is commonly used in CIS. But we bin together not only the photodiodes, but also the photoreceptor outputs. And that also reduces noise, because they're collecting more photons. So more in time and more in space. And, that, and both of those things help. And then we can either leave the, all the pixels on or just turn off four of them, three of them. OK, so the effect of all this is quite dramatic, because a standard DVS, if you look at the fraction of the pixels responding to a step of a certain contrast here in E-folds, a standard DVS has a threshold for on and off of about 15%. By adding this preamplifier and these other tricks here, you can push that all the way down to about 1%, 1 or 2% contrast change that you can see. And that's shown in, in this video, which compares the side DVS in binning mode with a Davis 346 from us in Innovation and a Prophecy Sony EVK4. That's our um, Gen 4, the latest, um, highest resolution sensor, all at the same pixel si uh, resolution here. In response to a chart like this, where there are 20% edges that reset the pixels, and then edges of very low contrast, for example, this 1.7% contrast, you probably can't even see the edge here, but there's a 1.7% contrast edge here, and you see that the side DVS is responding to that here, at least some of the pixels are. It's certainly responding to the 2.2 opposite it, these are 2.2%, but these other sensors don't respond at all to that, even when we optimize them as much as possible. So we're really down that 1% or 2% uh, intensity uh, change detection, and this is only at 20 lux illuminating the chart. This isn't 20 kilo lux, this is only 20 lux, which is like your indoor living room at night. Okay, so Rui is very proud of these um, lovely things that she showed you. You can still do fast, fast, see fast things, 100 hertz and high dynamic things where you cover half the chart with an ND4 filter. And even through a telescope, you can see things like the moon and Jupiter and four of its moons. 
One, the, you're jiggling the camera here to get this. One, two, three, and actually one fourth moon is right here next to Jupiter. It's cool, huh? Yeah. That's about all the stuff we did scientifically with it. We haven't actually done any neuroscience experiments with that. And that's all I want to show you for the slides on behalf of all the sponsors and stuff. And take a look at our website. And then maybe I have like a couple of minutes for a demo, right? Or do you want to just ask questions? Maybe we go thanks, thanks to week. Sure. Maybe we go through the uh, thank questions you, anyhow. And, uh, and then you can show a demo. Yeah. Uh, yeah, go ahead and ask your thing. I have to mess with this anyway, any, it's not working. Any question? Cindy. <laughs> Hi, Professor. Thanks for the inside talk. Um, I got only one question. So with this new EVS sensor front end, uh, the PhD student actually developed, it, can I simply understand that the noise get, uh, noise performance gets better because of the bandwidth? Just basically get uh, lower. Is that simple? So uh, the question is, with this scientific DVS, which is just a prototype, um, we can see smaller contrast because we can make it slower, we can bin, and we have big, big photodiodes and about 40% fill factor. But it's simply, is, is that the question? Yes. So, um, yeah. And the problem is the industrial cameras don't focus on that. They're in the megapixel race. They have to make really small pictures, otherwise nobody put them in a cell phone, right? Correct. But we don't have to worry because we're scientists. Just like Janelia Farm, when they developed the Neuropixel probe, you know, which is widely used by many neuroscience groups, they spent like 20 or 30 million on developing these, these brain probes. I think that we can also fund you know, such a scientific event camera for neuroscience applications, but not for consumer electronics. OK, I understand. Thank you. OK, thanks, Cindy. Anyone else? Jenny? Ah, shit. I just stopped this. <laughs> um, you have any other question? Otherwise, I want to just give you one quick demo here of this Davis, which is the camera that we um, designed completely in our own group and uh, is being sold by Innovation. Ah. You can tell it's still a bit of a prototype. <coughs> okay. So now you see it's actually putting out its gray frames and it's putting out brightness change events, which are same color as thing, but I'll change the color scheme so you now you see the events in red and green. And now if you wave your hand a bit, I'll make this bigger. Right, and now I'll turn off the frames. Okay, you can see it, right? And you get these brightness change events and I'll put on whoever's hand is waving really strongly there. Somebody wave or just wave their hand right there. You almost got it. Okay, somehow I don't hear the sound. Anyway, you should hear the spiking sound. If everything was working right, you would hear spiking sounds, which I don't quite have. But you would actually hear that pixel spiking. Of course, it's not working now. Um, volume mixer, output device, headphones. Eh, it should be working. OK. Yeah. Ah, yeah. So now, whoever is there can simulate the receptive field of this cell, whoever is right there. I'll show you the picture. Yeah, that's you right there with the, you, uh, yes, there you go. Yeah, you hear, he's actually simulating that pixel, just like you would hear a cell in the, in the, in the retina. Now, you see the frames are not very high quality, but the cool thing is about, about this is that if I stop down the lens to make it darker, I'm going to make it really dark here by just stopping the aperture down. You see it's getting darker? As a result, the exposure has to be increased. There's an auto exposure controller loop. Now the exposure is about 240 milliseconds, quarter second, right? If I turn off the events and move the camera around even a little bit, it's terribly motion blurred, hopeless. But let's look at the events under this condition. See, they're not really blurred. That's because of the speed. Let me turn off the spikes here. It's not blurred, right? If I, if I show it in, uh, in grayscale, it looks more like a picture. And it's much less blurred than these frames at 250 milliseconds. The last thing I want to show you that's really cool is the electronic stabilization. So on every one of these cameras, we also put a little cell phone IMU, which is like a vestibular system. We use the rate gyro to measure the rotation of the camera, and then we can electronically stabilize its output by steering each address back to its starting point. And if I turn that on here with the Steadicam and go back to this, now I'm going to, I have to swap this off and on. 
Okay, so if I now move around without the Steadicam, it's jiggling, that's like somebody wearing it on their head, right? Walking along. Now turn it on. Can you see it here? Even if I, even if I dramatically rotate it, Okay, the picture's not the greatest right now, but you can see that it, this, is, this is the Steadicam on and off. Severe motion blur, right? Turn it on. You can electronically stabilize extremely well. You can imagine this being quite useful when you have spectacles and you're trying to do localization with spectacles. Yeah. Anyway, that's all I have time for. Thank you. There was another question from Yeah. Is that working? Uh, Hello, Professor. Uh, thanks for the talk. I'd like to ask, um, because you, when, when you were referring to your uh, noise um, optimization, based, I think you were using a, a lower bandwidth to limit the noise, um, but would that give you higher latency? From yeah. The, there's no such thing as a free lunch, just like what Al Rose like showed. You know, there's robots, no way yeah. to get around the fact that if you want to see small contrast, you, know, you need bigger area or more photons, you know, more in space, more in time. And, you know, of course, in reality, you're gonna have lots of correlation in a neuron, right? There's gonna be lots of correlation along the neuron, so you won't be limited to one pixel. If you had to be one pixel, then it'd be hopeless. But since normally you have hundreds of pixels involved in a neuron, of course, you can use all kinds of fancy methods to correlate that activity in space and time, right? And That's and the hope, at least, <laughs> yeah. So the latency would not give you a problem because I guess you would like to see like, okay, your spiking of the neuron together with some, I don't know, hand moving or some, some external activities? Yeah, I mean, in general, neuroscientists want to understand how information, the question is what would you do with this if you're monitoring neural activity, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, neuroscientists want to understand how information flows around in the brain. And to do that, they have to measure the timing rather precisely because everything is driven by these spike events in your brain, which is very sparse activity in general. But the timing is incredibly important for things like learning. The pre and post spike timing is, is, very, is critical for learning and things like that. So in general, they just want more information, more raw data. You know, when is it ever bad to have more raw data? Neuroscientists are always seeking that. They're going along a Moore's race, uh, Moore's law, you know, in that much slower, like six, seven year uh, scaling. But you know, in general, it's that. But then, you know, ultimately, you're going to have brain implants that um, at least treat some neural diseases. You know, like you already have for Parkinson's and um, epilepsy. They do monitoring, but right now, they can't actively quench epilepsy or anything. I mean, I'm completely speculating about that. But you know, epilepsy is a big problem, especially if it's focal, right? If you don't want to cut out that piece of the brain, mm -hmm. ideally. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, it's a bit Which can still do useful computation for the most part. Okay, thanks. Thanks, okay. Toby. Thanks, Jenny. Is that, we, we still have. Uh, By the way, all these robots question. that I played here are all little things that I played around with with the DVS, you know, showing that you could do very quick robotics, <coughs> quick visual robotics at low computational effort. Like this uh, pencil balancing robot is a lovely demonstration where you have. You can also build cool robots like this money catching robot here. Well, this is the money catcher, you know, the game you play in the bar where uh -huh. you say, here. Can you catch this? You show that then they can't catch it because they're too slow, right? But here this robot can catch the bill, right? That's how you make people pay for drinks. <laughs> and then, yeah, this other robot um, was the, was the uh, pencil balancer. Well, this is the goalie, the famous goalie robot. But anyway, here you have two embedded DVS where all the computation is done on the microcontroller that can balance a pencil. This is some gesture recognition. Anyway, I don't have to talk about that. Okay. I, I think, Fabio, you had a question. Okay, right. Yeah, okay, that's enough. Okay, anyway. uh, we, no, no, we've got the tea break. Uh, thank you, Toby. Thank you. That's fine. And, uh, yeah.